In Module 7 of New Testament Survey, we are studying the general epistles, or what are known as the Catholic texts of the New Testament. These texts, or these writings, are meant to address the general situation that all believers are facing at this time, and are meant to be circulated among all of the churches within the growing Roman Empire. Several themes emerge in these Catholic epistles that are important, but perhaps the most important theme that is developed in these later writings in the New Testament is the suffering that Christians are undergoing at the hands of the Roman Empire, which has forced them to live in exile from their homeland. One of the major questions that followers of Christ are asking themselves at this time is how they're going to endure and survive the exile, not just as individuals, but also as a people, as the church. One of the most important techniques for long-term survival of a people throughout history is the establishment of institutions that can help to solidify that people's identity in the world and help to provide them with a social hierarchy um, and a moral code that will allow them to persist in the face of difficulty and persecution. And so in these Catholic texts or general epistles of the New Testament, we see the earliest emergence of distinctively Christian institutions and teachings, the earliest emergence of what we might call the Christian church. Now, it is worth pausing here to ask why the church began at this time to be concerned with its long-term survival. The short answer to that question is this. The expected return of Jesus to earth had not yet happened. Remember, at the very beginning of the book of Acts, the disciples were promised that the risen Jesus will return from heaven. And Jesus himself had earlier told the disciples and the crowds among them that some there will not even taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This led to the belief among many Christians that the reign of God will be fulfilled in a return of the resurrected Christ to earth, in which the powers of this world would be overturned in a final act of power, and the reign of God would be present in its fullness. Many disciples of Jesus considered that this would happen in their lifetime. But by the end of the first century AD, most of those first generation disciples had already died either as martyrs at the hands of the Roman Empire or just simply by reason of illness or just natural causes from old age. So the churches had to start grappling with the reality that Jesus may not return as quickly as expected. And so they had to begin preparing for their survival in the meantime. This is the context in which the general epistles are written. What are we to do to ensure the church's survival in the face of an empire that is so determined at all costs to bring about the church's destruction? One strategy for answering this question in the early church was to draw upon a common philosophy of that day and adapt that philosophy's teachings to the given structure of the church's life and thought. A good example of this is the first letter of Peter, which draws in many ways on the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoicism was a philosophy that taught that all things were ordered by God for the good of the whole and that moral goodness was found in accepting your role in society and playing that role well. The author of 1 Peter begins by talking about the current suffering of Christians under the grip of the Roman Empire as a participation in Christ's sufferings, for which they are to rejoice because while they suffer now, the sufferings of Christ ensure that the outcome of their faith will be the salvation of their souls. 
Then, when it comes to discussing how we should live in the world, the author of 1 Peter draws upon the Stoic moral tradition of what are called household codes. Smith and Kim refer to these, which are basically just a set of rules that are meant to order people's relationships within society. So, for example, slaves are told to be obedient to their masters in 1 Peter. Wives are told to be subject to their husbands, even as husbands are told to honor their wives as the weaker sex. All believers are called upon to, quote, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of emperors or governors, even as they treat you unjustly, the author of 1 Peter says. Now, the author is clear to remind the reader that the believer is to remain immersed in the love of God and one another, to stand strong in God's grace while awaiting a future justice coming for God's people. And he emphasizes throughout our relationships to one another should always be determined by the example of Jesus Christ, who in his suffering gave himself for his church. Scholars, however, are divided on how these household codes are to be read. Is the point to behave in such a way at, that you are not seen as a threat to the Roman Empire, but rather as obedient citizens? Do these teachings merely tell oppressed and marginalized persons to simply accept their place and their role in society? Or is the church's adaptation of the household codes more radical and subversive than that? Does the Christian church's adaptation of these teachings actually give moral agency to persons who previously had no agency in society at all? Women and slaves, for example. Are we really imitating Christ's sufferings when we accept our suffering and subordination? in relation to one another in society? However we answer these questions, we have to grapple with the fact that already in the New Testament, there were those in the church who used, the teachings, used these teachings to justify keeping so-called weaker persons subservient to those who were more knowledgeable of God's truth. And so, quote, stronger in the faith. The letter of James is actually written to address just this kind of problem within the church. The author of James wants to put the emphasis back upon faith in God's grace as that which allows us to persevere in the face of suffering. But he emphasizes famously that faith without works, without action, is dead. It seems that some people in the church, by accepting the favor that came from their good standing in society, had themselves become rich and powerful, and in their wealth had ceased to care for the poor and the oppressed among them. In some cases, even taking the poor among them to court and suing them, taking advantage of the poor and the oppressed. But what James emphasizes is that this is no faith at all. The only way we persevere in the faith is by working to give life to those who are having life crushed out of them by the cold, unjust hand of the powers of this world. The widow, the poor, the orphan. However we order our lives in this world, the church must be ordered by the work that it does for these persons in society. According to James, caring for the widow, the poor, the orphan, just is how the church's life should be ordered in this world. To forget this is to abandon the true faith for the sake of a wealth and a prosperity that looks an awful lot like the wealth and prosperity of the powers of this world. So perhaps this is the question that the Catholic epistles and the emergence of the early institutional Christian church 
puts to us. How are we to persevere in the faith, standing firm in love without having to worry so much about our own survival that we begin to live according to the unjust ways of the world around us?